Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome, welcome back to St. Margaret's Church for this C.S. Lewis Symposium. Uh, a delight. I know there are one or two who have just arrived now, so a particular welcome to you uh, for part of this day. Before we start this session, I did want to say thank you on behalf of the Westminster Abbey Institute, particularly to Dr. Michael Ward for his part in bringing this uh, two days together. Um, I know in talking to my colleague, uh, Canon Vernon White, who's also been very heavily involved, uh, what a significant part you've played in this and that today wouldn't be happening without your energy and input. So we're most grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Canon Tremlett. Good evening. Uh, and yes, can I echo his thanks to Vernon White? It's such a shame that Vernon has lost his voice and that we haven't heard from him today, because really he is the, uh, the progenitor of this whole event. It was he who, back in January last year, 2012, foresaw that this anniversary was approaching and wondered what the Abbey Institute might achieve uh, by way of marking it. And so he got in touch with me and we had a chat about what might uh, transpire. So thank you, Vernon White. <laughs> and thanks also to Claire Foster Gilbert, the director of the Abbey Institute, who alas has gone down with shingles. Uh, so she also is uh, hors de combat today. But uh, she also has played a huge part in making this thing happen. And finally, uh, thank you to all of you for coming, and especially those of you who have given so generously to the costs of the memorial that will be unveiled tomorrow. Uh, if you are still wishing to give to this project, you might be interested to know that there's an overflow memorial project. Um, and tomorrow at the end of the Thanksgiving service, there will be a, a collection in aid of a new C.S. Lewis Scholarship at the University of Cambridge. This is the idea of uh, Professor Helen Cooper, who holds the chair in medieval and Renaissance English uh, that Lewis was the first occupant of. And she has uh, devised with the people at Cambridge a new C.S. Lewis studentship in medieval and Renaissance literature. So if you wish to give to that, uh, please come ready to do so tomorrow at the service and uh, Gifts by check can also be accepted. Before we actually begin the panel discussion, uh, let me just alert you to something that will happen right at the end of it. And it's highly appropriate uh, on this occasion when we're about to memorialize Lewis in Poet's Corner that we should hear one of his poems. We've already heard Reason from Malcolm Geit, but at the end of the panel discussion, I shall ask Professor Don King to come and read Lewis's poem, The Apologist's Evening Prayer, which seems an appropriate way to round off our uh, discussions tonight. Professor King is working on a, a new comprehensive uh, edition of Lewis's poetry, which will be published next year by Kent State University Press. On our panel tonight, I am pleased to welcome Professor William Lane Craig, Research Professor of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, California, the author of many books, including Divine Foreknowledge and Human Freedom and God, Time and Eternity. Michael Ramsden, Director of the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics and Honorary Fellow of Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. The Reverend Dr. Jeanette Sears, writer and speaker, who did her PhD at Manchester and postdoc at Harvard. She's the author of a Murder in Michaelmas, Pig's Progress, and has a special interest in the Inklings and Dorothy L. Sayers. 
Peter S. Williams is philosopher in residence at the Damaris Trust and a writer and Christian apologist. He's the author of C.S. Lewis versus the New Atheists and A Skeptic's Guide to Atheism. And last but not least, Dr. Judith Wolf, fellow of St. John's College, Oxford, co-editor of C.S. Lewis and the Church, Essays in Honor of Walter Hooper, and general editor of the Journal of Inklings Studies. Please would really you welcome our panel. Before we come to the questions, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to make a very brief opening statement about what they regard as especially valuable or interesting about Lewis's work in Christian apologetics and what we might learn from his legacy today. So, Bill Craig. All right, thank you. Dr. Ward has invited each of us to say uh, 300 words or less about, quote, those aspects of Lewis's apologetic work which we regard as especially valuable and especially worth learning from. Here are my 296 words. <laughs> C.S. Lewis lived through and wrote during the height of the positivist era in Oxford. The times of A.J. Eyre and Anthony Flew, of verificationism and the alleged meaninglessness of religious, ethical, and metaphysical discourse. He lived to see the crumbling of positivism and the advent of postmodernism. I am so grateful that Lewis never succumbed to the bullying of verificationism or the blandishments of postmodernism. He was consciously and uncompromisingly a pre-modern man, a dinosaur, as he put it. I am, he declared, a rationalist. Reason can apprehend truth, and truth is objective and knowable. He bucked conventional wisdom by presenting a variety of arguments for God's existence, and he rejected the relativity of history arguing for the historical veracity of the gospel's record of the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Lewis was thus a champion of both natural theology and Christian evidences. As such, he modeled for us a well-rounded Christian apologetic on behalf of what he called mere Christianity. If I may speak personally, my own approach has been inspired by Lewis's model. I have self-consciously focused on the defense of mere Christianity based upon the twin pillars of God's existence as demonstrated by natural theology and the resurrection of Jesus as established by historical critical studies of the New Testament. Finally, on a practical level, Lewis has been a model to me of the ministry of the published word. I'm struck by the fact that through the legacy of the works he left behind, Lewis has reached far more people for Christ since his death than he ever did during his life. This has motivated me personally to try to produce in my own small way a body of published work which I hope in God's providence may outlive me as well. And now Michael Ramsden. Well, what I learned from Lewis, um, now working as a full-time Christian apologist, um, was really very simple and was said so beautifully and so eloquently in the lectures here this afternoon. And if you weren't here for those, then you certainly need to get hold of the recordings. And in one sense, it was very simple. Uh, truth has a revelatory function. Um, one of the functions of truth, it helps you to see things as they are. Rather like if someone comes and gives you a complicated lecture and you have no idea what they said, and someone turns to you and a couple of minutes tells you and sums it up beautifully, on receiving the explanation, you normally respond by saying, oh, I, I see. And you feel like you suddenly see something, not just simply that you understand it, but you now see something you were unable to see before. And what I found through Lewis's writings was he helped me to see things as they were. We don't even bother praying for that which we can't even imagine to be true. And in a world of growing skepticism and the kind of hostility that's already been referred to, 
Um, C.S. Lewis was a master at presenting the truth to help us see things as they are, both about the person of Christ, the world we live, and who we are. And one of the ways he did that as well, which I know has stuck with me and influenced my own apologetics immensely, is his love for language and the importance of words. It's hard to read almost any of his apologetic work and not realize he spent a huge amount of time on the defense of words. Um, I'm sure this has affected me in all kinds of ways. I happen to own the 20-volume Oxford English Dictionary, um, which I keep in my study and regularly use. As someone once said, it's not the most interesting book to read, but it does explain every word as you go through. And it gives you, it gives you a true a sense of what do these words mean and where might that meaning have changed in my audience and how might I recover this vocabulary so that people can see this truth and respond to it. Jeanette Sears. Thank you. Well, I uh, love Lewis not just because of who he was, uh, not just for his writings, but also because of how he talked about his writings, uh, how he described his methodology and gave us pictures of how to do it, which makes us feel that perhaps we can do it as well, which is really rather important. And so first of all, I love the way he describes his works of apologetic, his nonfiction, his popular theology, as works of translation. And I love the idea of that being translation, that you're translating something that can seem quite complicated or dull or too deep. Perhaps people feel they can't understand Christian doctrine, the faith as it's been handed down. But Lewis translates it for us into words we can understand, into images, into wonderful stories we actually want to read. And he said that this was really easy. In one of his letters, he says um, he wants to start a school of translation, that it's a trick that anybody can learn. Uh, we all ought to be able to do it. So uh, I think that's really encouraging from him, that he wants everyone to do that. And then secondly, I love the fact that he described his works of fiction as works of supposition and the idea that they're supposals and that uh, you can think, well, what if? What if something happened? What if there was uh, another planet with different species on it, but they were in the same trouble as we were and they needed saving? Or what if uh, there are talking animals in a medieval forest and uh, they also have a king who's one of the animals who is like a dying and rising god? And you can get to know him in that context. So I love the idea of, of supposals or supposition, uh, the what if side of his stories, and that all writers are creating other worlds. And so the other, with a capital O, that he wants you to meet in his other world, really, is God. And I think he does that brilliantly in his works of supposition. And lastly, uh, another word ending in shun, you've had translation, supposition, and now imitation, um, because I think it's Lewis the man as well that we love, as well as his works, isn't it? Uh, we've even had films about his life. How many Oxford academics have films made about their love lives? Uh, it's not usually that interesting. Um, so the fact that we love him, he, he did attempt to imitate Christ, the imitatio Christi. He attempted to live like Christ. And we all know that phrase, what would Jesus do? Well, I think you can often ask yourself, what would Lewis do or think or say? And often you'd be absolutely spot on. But I think, so that's the third shun. Uh, that leads to my admiration, my inspiration, uh, perhaps emulation as well. But um, can we expect another Lewis? I don't know. Perhaps we want to talk about that tonight. Perhaps it will be someone or something completely different to Lewis. As uh, Aslan did say to Lucy in Prince Caspian, when she was wanting Aslan to come and save them again with a big roar and save them in exactly the way he had in the first story, uh, Aslan said to her, probably dear one, I can't remember if he said dear one on this occasion, but probably dear one, things never happen the same way twice. So perhaps God's got something very different for us. Peter Williams. Researching uh, my recent book, C.S. Lewis versus the New Atheists, it struck me that Lewis had been the old-fashioned kind of atheist who takes philosophy seriously. As an atheist, Lewis rejected scientism one might say that the atheism of Lucretius saved Lewis from the positivism of A.J. Eyre. Moreover, Lewis didn't lurch 
from the mistakes of modernism to the mistakes of postmodernism. His love of philosophy produced neither a narrow rationalism nor a romantic anti rationalism, but a pre modern wisdom. Lewis knew that reason requires faith in rational insight. And he recognized the value of empirical facts without rejecting the transcendental facts of truth, goodness, and beauty. So Lewis attended to arguments against naturalism and for theism. In mere Christianity, he brilliantly popularized the sort of moral argument for God developed by W.R. Sawley's Gifford Lectures on moral values and the idea of God. However, it's the reasons that Lewis gave for abandoning a naturalistic worldview that resonate most incessantly today. It's not only in reading, say, Alvin Plantinga's anti-naturalism argument from evolution that one is reminded of Lewis's anti-naturalistic apologetic in Miracles. It's frequently in reading non-theistic scholars like Thomas Nagel, Anthony O'Hare, or Raymond Tallis. One can't separate Lewis's philosophy from his fiction. His philosophy often uses story to elicit rational insight. Uh, consider Lewis's meditation in a tool shed. And his fiction fleshes out a philosophical skeleton, allowing us to, to imbibe the atmosphere of a philosophy. I particularly enjoy the abolition of man through that hideous strength. Lewis teaches us the importance of being nourished by a community of scholarship, including voices of dissent, jointly dedicated to following the argument wherever it leads. And finally, Lewis helps us transcend the chronological snobbery of our own age through the reading of old books, not least those by Lewis himself. Thank you. And now, uh, Judith Wolfe. Thank you. <clears throat> As I recently wrote, I was struck by something that Richard Dawkins said in a recent debate with Rowan Williams at the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford. A member of the audience asked him what sense he could make of the senseless tragedy of the violent death of a young child. And Richard Dawkins stared at her and said, I don't see any problem or tragedy here. It might be sad for the mother, but it's nothing other than the workings of evolution. And I think Lewis came to the same conclusion that for the purely evolutionary thinker, there is no problem of evil because there is nothing that qualifies as evil. The natural evolutionary order gives us no standards of justice or goodness, and therefore also nothing that can count as violating them and therefore constituting evil. And so for the purely evolutionary thinker, our very deeply human responses of outrage or indignation at evil must be written off as pure illusions. So when Lewis came to God, I think it was not so much as a foolproof answer to the problem of evil or other problems like it, but rather as a reality that accommodated, made possible our feelings in their full range of outrage and indignation and so forth, something that made the problem of evil and others like it possible in the first place. And I think that this approach to apologetics of not starting from prepackaged, abstract, nicely arranged rational arguments, but rather from attentiveness to the full range of what makes us human and seeing what view of the world can accommodate that is something that we should emulate as apologists and indeed as uh, Christians more generally. Thank you all very much. Now to our questions. And the first one uh, is one that Canon Vernon White, despite having lost his voice, uh, managed to croak out to me during one of the breaks. <laughs> and it's a very important aspect of Lewis's thought. Uh, perhaps Lewis's most serious work of apologetics was his book Miracles, a preliminary study. And Canon White was asking about what the panel thought of Lewis's argument in Miracles about the, the apologetic value of reason itself. 
about how reason may be understood as itself relatively supernatural to, to our material organisms, and therefore indicative, perhaps, of something which is fully supernatural. So, panel, what do you make of miracles? Do the philosophers want to start? Well, it was something that I, I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, how very um, contemporary Lewis's discussion of the, the problems uh, of a naturalistic worldview in trying to account for the nature of human rationality is. It's something that's still very much being discussed in the philosophical literature today. Um, the most recent edition of the, the world's um, uh, biggest circulating philosophy of religion journal, Philosophia Christi, for example, had a, uh, an article in it by a contemporary philosopher defending C.S. Lewis's argument uh, from miracles and interacting uh, with Alvin Plantinga's similar argument that he gave a number of years ago uh, in uh, Warrant and Proper Function, where Alvin Plantinga specifically footnoted um, that his argument uh, bore some similarities with the argument that Lewis had given. Um, so it's still very much alive. And as I say, it's actually, I think, increasingly uh, a point of tension that you can see atheist writers recognizing within a naturalistic worldview. So if you read Thomas Nagel's recent book, Mind and Cosmos, there you, you, you see passages of Nagel's book read like, good grief, am I reading Miracles by C.S. Lewis? No, I'm reading a book by an atheist philosopher of mind, <laughs> wrestling with how do I, can you put reason into a naturalistic worldview and saying in the end, we don't know how to. I don't see how to. And indeed he says, I really hope that God is not the answer to this, yeah, but, but I don't know what else is. But, but, it, but he's really struggling to try Very and find a way a of doing it. Yeah. Yes. I remember speaking in an Oxford University college about 18 years ago, and the master of the college had started out life in that place as an undergraduate student, done his postgraduate degree there, became a lecturer there, seen, went up through the ranks, ended up as master of the college. And um, I was speaking in chapel um, that Sunday evening, and he happened to be there, and it was full. And at the end, he said, could you come back to my study for a drink? So I thought either I'm going to be told off or asked a question. Uh, thankfully, it was a question. And as he handed me um, a glass of port, he simply said, you know, when I was, an, when I was a, a young academic here, we all used to make fun of C.S. Lewis. And we even had a debate in this college about shutting down the chapel because it was obsolete and thought we should convert it into a second library. It would be more useful to the students who were here. And I'd actually used, uh, one of my points had been from miracles and uh, um, C.S. Lewis's argument and comments about reason and how do we account for the process of reason and how can we trust reason itself. And then he said to me, you know, we used to make fun of him. He says, but if you, he says, today in the chapel, it was filled. There wasn't a single spare seat. He said, and if you went into the senior common room of my college, every Don I know is reading a C.S. Lewis book right now. Oh. <laughs> and so I think this is one of the remarkable legacies of Lewis. He, we, we think of people as being prophetic, and we often use that term to, about telling the future. Um, I mean, any good Old Testament scholar will tell you that's the minor use of the word prophecy biblically. It's not about telling the future, it's about interpreting the times. And I think Lewis was able to interpret the times by revealing things as they really were and just show naturally where it would go. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's still so contemporary um, and why almost any book on apologetics you pick up today is almost bound to have a Lewis, Lewis quote. As a matter of fact, maybe someone should write a book on apologetics without a Lewis <laughs> quote uh, in it and see, see what would happen. But... Um, and I remember, to my shame, on the reason question that you raise, coming up with this argument myself one day as a postgraduate student with, a, with my professor of philosophy who described himself as a born-again atheist. And we were at 2 a.m., and I came up with this argument from reason, and I was so impressed with myself and thought, wow, I could write this up, and then realized at about 3 a.m., having finished the conversation at 2, that actually Lewis had already said that, and I just momentarily forgot uh, where he'd already put it uh, subconsciously. So uh, I think that just some, demonstrates how he gets into your mind and imagination, even when you're not conscious that he's necessarily with you. Thank you. Bill Craig, would you like to chime well, in? Well, I would just say that one thing that we need to keep in mind with respect to these arguments, and I think this is such a perfect illustration, is that contemporary Christian philosophy, which is experiencing a tremendous renaissance, stands on Lewis's shoulders and moves beyond him. It's not as though we should simply read C.S. Lewis as the final thought on these arguments. 
Alvin Plantinga, in particular, has developed this arg uh, evolutionary argument against naturalism with tremendous rigor and precision that Lewis didn't have. What Lewis grasped in a kind of rough and ready way, Plantinga has developed in a very meticulous and rigorous way to show that if our cognitive faculties are the product of naturalistic evolutionary processes, then we cannot have any confidence in the reliability of our cognitive faculties. But if that's true, it's self-defeating because you can't have any or confidence in the reliability of those faculties in telling you that naturalism is true or that this argument is correct. So Plantinga says that naturalism has a built-in defeater and so cannot be rationally affirmed. And so I would just encourage all of us who are studying apologetics not to take Lewis as the final word, but to use him as a springboard for further reflection, further advancement in developing these arguments. Thank you. And what I would like to add to that as well is um, that when I read Miracles as a teenager, um, you know, I was reading a book of really quite sophisticated philosophy as a teenager who normally would be reading about pop music or rock stars or whatever. And Lewis was such a brilliant communicator that I was absolutely riveted and it felt like the most exciting subject I'd ever read. And it was great to know that as a Christian, reason was on my side somehow. Instead of it being reason versus faith, um, I, as this young, tiny Christian, as it were, could actually have reason on my side when I was relating with non-Christians. And so it was a tremendous encouragement on that level too. Thank you. All right, from the value of reason to the dangers of imagination. This is a question from Sarah de Nordwall, who describes herself as a poet. What do we have to do to ensure that our imaginations don't lead us into spiritually dangerous places? <laughs> Who would like to come in on that? Well, I think Lewis was a great believer in intellectual chastity. I think that's probably how he would put it, perhaps. Um, and that our minds have to be open to God and God's spirit. And I think it's part of our, our daily spiritual discipline. You know, what we open our minds to is incredibly important. And I think Lewis was a very disciplined person and certainly took this very seriously, what, what he fed his mind on. And so I think he would say, it, he would place it in our daily spiritual disciplines probably, wouldn't he, that uh, that was the most important thing. And that because the visual was so important to him, uh, what we look at is incredibly important, and of course it becomes part of our brains uh, forever. So uh, we have to be very careful what we look at, mm. and that it's uh, something in line with with what God would want. Yes. In fact, he, he talked about disciplining, disciplining his imagination even before he was a theist, let alone a Christian. Um, if I myself may make a brief comment on this point, I think one of Lewis's, um, Lewis's own ways of answering this question would be to say that um, the imagination needs to be um, operated in consort with, with the reason. Mm that imagination which just runs amok without any rational control over it is, is not the imagination as Lewis understands it. it it's, the, it's merely the imaginary. It, it has no necessary value in itself. It's, it's just like the, the muddle of visions which flood through our minds at night in our dreams. Um, the natural, or the, the organ of meaning, the imagination, needs to, needs to submit its findings to the natural organ of truth. For, for an adjudication to be made about the value of those meanings. Are they true? Are they false? And that, of course, is the substance of his great war with Owen Barfield, his good friend who believed that the imagination could apprehend truths that reason was not capable of reaching. And C.S. Lewis made the very clear distinction that we've heard about earlier this afternoon, that reason is the organ of truth, whereas the imagination is the organ of meaning but the imagination has to submit to the judgment of truth. And I think that when he became a Christian later on, he saw this organ of truth not only as reason, but also as revelation. And so an adherence to revealed doctrine was always something that he held on to as a means of disciplining his imagination and keeping it in its bounds, just as Coleridge, of course, does. Um, when he frets about his wayward imagination in the Aeolian harp, for example, and then goes back to doctrine as, uh, as reining it in. Thank you. Anybody else? I think I know Dr. Geit. It's funny, we're right here. We've got 
people in the audience here who know more about this than, or I've forgotten more about this than we actually learned in the first place, I think addressed this question specifically in his lecture, I think, very, very well. Um, so um, I, I, I'm going to refer you back to, uh, to, uh, to that recording and claim that I had all of those thoughts in my head before he presented them so eloquently <laughs> this afternoon anyway. Thanks. Let's move on to a third question from uh, Jenny Peterson, which rather picks up on the point that Jeanette was just making about the importance of what we look at. The question asks, Lewis wrote and broadcast before the current era with its cultural dominance of visual media in film and television. In what ways might these new visual media inhibit or enhance Christian apologetics? Hmm. I can say something about the way in which it can enhance the reach of Christian apologetics. I think that YouTube is an incredible tool for apologetics and world evangelization because through the internet, these materials get into all sorts of contexts where persons would never read a book or have access to library materials. And I have found that making a YouTube archive of talks, uh, debates, interviews, panels of this sort will reach thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people through YouTube. So we as Christian apologists need to be very aggressive and proactive in using YouTube and the internet to disseminate uh, these materials. Thank you. I mean, I have a feeling, Michael, you, you, you know more about this than us, but I, I have to admit, I've been very skeptical about the new media, um, you know, often fueled by you know, the comment that YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook were going to merge into a new URL, utwitface.com. Um, <laughs> And I, I think um, maybe that's coming from seeing the irresponsible use of it. And it's quite interesting, I guess, if you, if you look at Lewis's biograph biographical life, he became a voice to the nation through his broadcast talks during the Second World War, uh, when actually there were no competing media, which is why he became such a household name. And he did so so, responsibi so responsibly, without a glib apologetic, but speaking in a situation where hundreds of thousands of people were dying and the cost was very high, which I think gave a reality to what he did. Then I think, sadly, maybe a lot of irresponsible and sensationalist voices came into the media. And I think a lot of Christians sort of recoiled from that slightly, thinking I don't want to be tarred with that brush. Maybe, maybe there was a bit of a vacuum left. I have a feeling if he were here, he might well say, look, um, nobody really knew much about radio you know, back then. It was quite a new medium to, for this kind of thing. Um, and you, you should fully engage with it. I, I think that's what he would say. I mean, you, you may have better insight. Than no, that. I'm sure you're right. I mean, Lewis was one of the first media dons, wasn't he? He and his maudlin colleague, A.J.P. Taylor, uh, they were a new breed. And yes, it was a very modern uh, medium, the wireless. I mean, not the radio, the wireless. <laughs> what do we mean by wireless now? Something quite different. Um, yeah. I just think a, a word as, as well about Christian use of media. In, in the less overt way, I and mean, Bill's talking about the, the sort of overt Christian apologetics and, and the way in which you can communicate that into different situations through YouTube and so on. But I think that our engagement with, with say, Christian film writers and filmmakers and so on especially um, can take that Leif Allen Lewis's book of, of, of the supposal, of doing things not in the, in the sort of direct, here's a gospel presentation, with an altar call at the end, kind of a way, but in that, uh, in that way of, of teasing the imagination of the little, the, the arrows of sunlight that Malcolm was talking about earlier today, um, the, the, to get people thinking in terms of the big, the deep spiritual, moral issues of life, the universe, and everything. Um, to get people thinking about Christ, first you have to get them to think. Getting people thinking about life, the universe, and everything. Um, opening up those issues, that in itself uh, is a really uh, positive part of, uh, of the engagement that I think Christians are called to uh, in today's media. Thank you. And of course, we're not just wanting people to think, we're wanting them to love if we're going to be Christians. And the irony is, is that we want to portray uh, God's love and loving relationships uh, in the right way in visual media and written media. 
uh, so for people who perhaps only look at that in order for people to then leave that in a way and then actually be involved in real relationships with God, with other people in the church and so on. How, how, can, we, how can we follow in Lewis's footsteps in giving media portrayals of goodness mm. that are interesting and captivating? Yes. Yeah. This, uh, what was it, utwitface.com? Um, <laughs> This new uh, phenomenon, which results in a large extent in, in globalization, um, national boundaries now mean much less than they did, uh, touches upon our next question from Rod Miller. Uh, is Lewis really growing in esteem in Britain, besides the Poets' Corner Memorial? And if so, is there a particular aspect of his writing or thinking that is fueling the growth? And in the related point, why is Lewis more popular in the US than in the UK? So we have one American and four <laughs> Brits on the panel. I don't know, Bill, if you would like to touch on the popularity in the US? I think Alistair McGrath is probably right when he says in his biography of Lewis that what happened in the United States is that Lewis connected with surging American evangelical Christianity. Since about 1948, uh, in the United States with Billy Graham, Carl F. H. Henry, Harold Ockengay, and so forth. Evangelicalism was born and has come to displace the old mainline Protestant denominations in the United States as the most culturally significant expression of Christianity. And evangelicals connected with C.S. Lewis, and rightly or wrongly, they saw him as one of them, uh, in a sense. And I think that has fueled enormous popularity in the United States with Lewis. Lewis's mere Christianity transcends denominational boundaries as well and makes him appealing. I understand from discussions with some of my colleagues that Lewis is tremendously popular in the Mormon church and that a good many Mormon people are moving away from traditional LDS doctrine, which thinks of God as a physical humanoid being on a planet in outer space, to a more classical theism of God as a transcendent creator of the universe. So Lewis is having an incredible influence even within so unexpected uh, a denomination or confession as, as the Mormon church. Thank you. Mm. I think there are two points to make about the British reception of Lewis. One is that now that he's been dead for 50 years, he's moved from a very annoying or almost threatening contemporary to a classic writer whom one can appreciate from a distance, almost as a primary source, so to say, about which one can debate and so forth. So there's a certain, certain distance and classical status that allows people to talk about him in new ways. Um, but the second point, I think, is that, uh, as, as you said, I think it's not so much that more people are reading him, but rather that it's become more um, uh, suitable for polite society to talk about it. I think that people have been reading him in their closets, and academics in particular have been reading him in their closets all this time, but now that people like Rowan Williams or Alistair McGrath and some others have stepped up uh, and engaged with him publicly and on a rigorous level, it's suddenly possible to talk about him, um, as, as I say, in polite society. Um, to look slightly further afield, uh, it's also interesting to note that in countries like Germany, for example, where there is a strong division, and speaking now as a theologian, in countries like Germany where there is a strong division between Lutherans or Protestants and Catholics, it seems to be mainly the Catholic academics who are engaging with Lewis and doing so very in a very lively way than the Lutherans, because for the Catholics, he is a champion of uh, a natural theology, an approach to God as in some way continuous with human reason and so forth. Whereas the, the, the Protestant theologians who are very strongly em, em, emphasizing a theology of the cross, of discontinuity between God and the world, are quite wary of him. So there's a much stronger confessional divide, I think, at least among theologians in those countries than here. Um, 
I'm tempted to, I agree with Lewis now being a classic and so having a different status and that making a big effect. I'm tempted to say that people become popular when someone can make money out of them. <laughs> and uh, it's certainly the case that with the films now, we all know that the films of the Narnia Chronicles uh, came on the back of the Tolkien films in many respects. And uh, obviously huge amounts of money being made out of those. And so that, and of course they're very filmic stories, so that, that makes a lot of sense. But um, probably the writer who was, has been the main Christian novelist recently in this country has been G.P. Taylor, who has written Christian novels, originally got a, a huge amount of money for them. Um, but as soon, he says, as soon as he started to be called the next C.S. Lewis, he was dropped like a hot brick by the media and everybody. So there's, it's a two-edged sword, really. Yeah. Thank you. In addition to the written questions that have been submitted, I've asked two people in the audience to ask a question. Um, and I've asked them because they each represent a very significant uh, Lewis institution in the United States. Um, so could the person with the roving microphone come up to the third pew here and ask a question of Stanley Matson, Dr. Stanley Matson, who is president of the Lewis Foundation, who have over many years restored Lewis's home, the Kilns, um, and run many successful Oxbridge conferences. So Stan, what, what question do you have for the panel? Well, thank you, Michael. Actually, I, I pondered uh, your, your invitation to come up with a question. And as I did, I was kind of amused with the question that I came up with. But it is a sincere question. And that is, uh, I think one of the things that most amazes me about Lewis is simply the extraordinary, prodigious nature of his work. You know, when William Lane Craig said before he goes, he'd like to leave a body of scholarship behind, you know, that would really make a statement and prove to be generative of a lot of good. But when one ponders the fact that he was a single person, now we know he was single in the sense he was not married, so they could see what he wrote an awful lot because he had no children. But in point of fact, we heard earlier today that he has a big family. I think Malcolm made that very clear, right? The DNA, was it Malcolm who made that point? Al Alistair. No, it was... Alistair. Right, Alistair, where is he? <laughs> Sorry about that. He's gone. But he had a big family. I mean, he related to so many people, whether it was in pubs, working in the kitchen at home for Mrs. Moore, uh, as Warney makes very, very clear, on command. I mean, his life was anything but that of a eunuch driven to, to publish works. And yet here, he, we would commonly say, over 40 published works, thousands of letters, and Walter, you, uh, Michael, you work with Walter, and I think I heard that the three volumes uh, published, there are only something like 40% or less of the total body of correspondence that he wrote with a pen. Hmm. With a pen, remind you. So I don't know how in the world a human being who is not a professor with a big endowed chair, but who is in fact a tutor working with students one-on-one, -on -one, so incredibly engaged his life. I marvel at it. I really do. And, and the phrase that came to me was, it was a case of incarnational apologetics. That is, his life was so invested in every idea, every person. When you say he pursued words with great penetration, I wonder if you'd comment on that. Those of you who've known people who work closely with him or in your own reading with him, if you've had that same sense of being overwhelmed knowing yourself how diligent <laughs> it is to write one book, mm. let alone Thank six, you. let alone 40. Would one of you like to comment? Thank you very much. Well, so um, I think the question might, might boil down to emulation. How, how can we possibly consider emulating someone who's sort of a, a giant among men? Um, is it possible? Should we even try? Uh, yes, I think we, well, we need to, um, we need to listen to God. We need to be like, um, I was thinking earlier of the green lady on Paralandra, who before she answers a question, she's quiet and she's listening to Malaldil. And she only answers when she knows what Melalda wants her to say. So I'm tempted just to sit here quietly <laughs> until the Lord shows me what to say. Um, it's a, a question of calling, isn't it? And when God gives a calling, he also empowers you to do that, that he's asking you to do. And so thank God that he did call Lewis to that work and that he empowered him to do it. And we all have different callings. And it's possible that even if we only wrote one book, that might be the thing that converts thousands. We, we only have to think of the Lord Jesus himself who never wrote any of his stories down and uh, look at the effect he's had. <laughs> Bill? 
Well, John Wesley once distinguished in an address to his Methodist ministers between what he called uh, innate abilities and acquired abilities. And if we don't have the innate abilities that a C.S. Lewis had, you're not going to be able to produce that body of work. But nevertheless, there are acquired abilities that we can all strive for. And I'm thinking here of things like self-discipline, time management, setting of priorities, uh, having a vision for writing, if that's what we feel called to do. And I think that these kinds of abilities can be acquired and can help us to be surprisingly productive. Um, one method that I've adopted in my work is what Jan and I call the turtle method, which is like in the story of the tortoise and the hare. The turtle just by steady, slow plodding eventually wins the race. And so if you can just write a paragraph one morning or a few pages that day, it's incredible how after the weeks go by, it begins to accumulate. And so I do think that through these kinds of self-disciplinary abilities, um, one can maximize whatever innate potentialities the Lord has given us so as to try to produce a body of written work for those of us who are called to be writers that will hopefully be read even after we're gone. Thank you. You know, I, I've had a, a working relationship with Professor Alastair McGrath now for 15 years. And when that started, I thought, gosh, every time he writes something, I should really buy it and read it. And uh, the dear man's almost bankrupted me. Um, so um, I think some people have a natural writing gift. Some people you pray that they wrote slightly less. Um, uh, but I, 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 I think we, as a, as a culture, and so maybe sometimes even as a church, we haven't always encouraged people uh, in the expression of their faith through the arts, not as an illustration of something else, but as a vehicle of communication for that something. And so, um, and, and I think we, we've paid the price for that in, in, some, in some ways. We haven't recognized the role, the vehicle by which this, this can happen. And you look at Jesus Christ who in many senses was a metaphorical theologian. He, he wasn't making complex theological points and then illustrating them with simple stories for children. The, the parable he told was the vehicle by which he was delivering his theology. It wasn't the illustration of something else. And I think that's something that the arts are uniquely gifted to do. It becomes the medium and the vehicle by which things can be passed on. And I think that's the one part of Lewis, I know someone asked the question earlier, that, that we really need to see encouraged. Um, again, where people can find the expression through poetry, through novels, through short stories, radio plays, um, to really engage with people out there, but through that medium where the message is, is embedded all the, way, all the way through it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'd just like to, to pick, pick up on, on that in talking about what I said about Lewis's embrace of the transcendental values of, of truth and goodness and beauty. Uh, and, and I think that the, the church historically here has been uh, pretty good on, on keeping the importance of truth and the word of God and so on. And of course, goodness and, and, and morals and ethics. The church is very big in talking about ethics, but has frankly largely dropped the ball on beauty. Uh, but beauty encompasses the other two. And beauty is that which is truly worthy of being admired, of admiration. Uh, it incorporates truth and goodness and the widest transcendental value is beauty. And I think uh, Lewis uh, should be a, a prod and a reminder uh, to the Western church uh, to uh, not take our eye off the place of beauty uh, in church, uh, in liturgy, in communication, in apologetics. Thank you. Judith, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I completely agree with William. I mean, if we look at Lewis's productivity, I think emulating him will become uh, a very frustrating task. But if we look at the, uh, the habits of mind and of heart that he cultivated, then those are something that we certainly can emulate, the attentiveness to others that you mentioned, Stan, um, self-discipline and so forth. And what fruits arise from that is, is not up to us, but we can certainly uh, cultivate those habits and see what comes. 
Thank you. Uh, one thing that occurs to me is that, Michael, you are, you're in charge of the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, and I teach in an apologetics programme for Houston Baptist University. We're, we're trying to train up uh, young apologists, but it occurs to me that, that Lewis never went through apologetic training. Um, in fact, he was a, a bit of a, a lone wolf. He, 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 he was not um, schooled uh, e even in the Eng English public school system um, for a couple or three years of his most formative period in his, in his middle teens. He was privately tutored one-to-one -one by William Kirkpatrick. He wasn't in a school. And I think that's, that's not unimportant in, in understanding Lewis's abilities, that he was, he was, to a certain extent, a free thinker, because he wasn't trammeled by the expectations of his contemporaries in the same way that most of his contemporaries were. Um, I read once that of the, of the top patent holders, those at ICI who hold the greatest number of patents, in the top 10 such people, I think four out of those 10 had not received a university education which is extremely interesting. There, there can be a way in which we, we squelch originality um, by overtraining people. Um, so it may be that the apologist, uh, the great new apologist who's going to, to wow the 21st century uh, is, is not even at a school. <laughs> Who knows? The, the second question from the audience uh, is going to come from Dr. Jerry Root. Um, so could the microphone come down to this the first pillar here? Uh, Jerry, if you'd hold your hand up or stand, thank you. Jerry is um, the representative of the Wade Center at Wheaton College, Illinois. The Wade Center is, is the primary uh, collection of Lewis's uh, papers and documents. Um, it was established, first of all, in the 1960s by Professor Clyde S. Kilby, and it's now the, the central place in the world if you want to study anything to do with Lewis, and Jerry is on the, the advisory board. So, Jerry, what is your question? And so is Michael Ward on the advisory board. <laughs> um, this is picking up on Dr. Matson's question. The book C.S. Lewis, Defender of the Faith, concludes, Lewis himself was his greatest apology, the apologetic that walked in shoes. Could you comment about his humility, his magnanimity, his willingness to shoulder the weight of his neighbor's glory, and how this lends to his persuasiveness as an apologist and as a Christian? Thank you. Who would like to come in on that? Wow. Well, I, I feel probably as the most humble member of the panel, I should comment first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, good one. I, I, I think the point you make is a very good one. I, if the gospel is true, um, we've already heard about it today, it's been the theme, it should be seen as well as heard, and most of all seen in the life of the Christian. And it's very interesting, I think if we were to say, look, close your eyes and imagine a thoroughly uncompromised and uncompromising Christian. And then we were to say, what figure came to mind? The answer is probably someone who was quite difficult, Awkward, hard, thoroughly outspoken maybe. Um, it's very interesting the, the kinds of things we would immediately put into that. But if you look at the book of Galatians, which we know to be one of the earliest you know, of all um, the um, uh, epistles and the, and the books that we have in the New Testament, amongst you know, one of the very first, the, um, the, the Paul there has several concerns, one of which is what is the real gospel and what isn't the real gospel. But then he has another concern, the Apostle Paul in Galatians, which is, well, what is the true characteristic of a Christian? And he tells us how to tell the true person who is a Christian from the fake. Um, in Galatians 5.22, he says there's a fruit of the Spirit, just one fruit. And when you taste that fruit, it should taste of love, joy, pace. And you don't need me to recite it. Some of you know little songs that You've learned all of those characteristics by heart. Now, I find that really interesting. What the Apostle Paul is saying there is bite me, but in a very nice way. And he's saying, look, if someone is claiming this is true and real in their life, you should be able to taste it in their life. And what you should taste should be this love and this peace and this joy and this gentleness and so on. Um, if, however, what you taste is murder, envy, lust, strife, you have the right to question their claim to have had this 
transforming, life-changing encounter with the person of Christ. And I think the reason why we like people like um, C.S. Lewis, I mean, I also have the, the privilege of working very closely with a guy called Professor John Lennox, who, you know, if you ever heard him speak, you, you feel halfway through his talk, you want to go up onto the platform and give him a big hug. Um, <laughs> because he's, he's so gentle and in his demeanor and his manner of delivery, and that is very attractive. And, and I think it's something that we need to, to, to recover and maybe become even more challenging maybe at times as Christians ourselves to say, well, what does the church look like? What, what does it taste like? Does it taste like this? Because that's what we're told it should. And so let's not be compromising about that. Let's be thoroughly uncompromising when it comes to things like, is this fruit? Does it taste like this in our life? And I think the church would be a lot stronger and have a much larger platform for its message if, if we were. Um, so I'm sure it was part of he commended his own message through his own lifestyle, but embodied by the, all the letters he wrote. I think it was a general principle, wasn't it? He tried to respond to every letter he got. I mean, I struggle responding to my emails. Um, um, and I'd love to know what he would have made of email. Maybe he would have seen that as some form of demonic attack. I don't know, that's how I feel. <laughs> but, um, but it just showed he valued the person. They had taken time to write to him. He wanted to write back to them, and, and he did. Thank you, Jeanette. Yes. Uh, speaking as someone who did actually give John Lennox a hug once, um, <laughs> I, I've started now as I get older, and lots of my friends are having to care for elderly relatives, and my mother gets older, and so on. And the word carer is starting to take on a whole new meaning. Um, I'm starting to see Lewis as a carer. He cared for so many people throughout his life, obviously for Mrs. Moore as she got older, um, for his wife Joy when she was ill, and for lots of his neighbors and relatives, and particularly his brother as well. And, and for animals, he loved animals and he cared about nature. And there's just that caring and taking responsibility for, you know, if someone's got a need and you're there, you're the one who looks after that person, what, whatever it means, clearing up off the floor or whatever. Um, Lewis was, was really um, right there in his caring. Thank you. Judith? And I think that one important thing about humility in particular is that for Lewis, humility was not just a spiritual virtue, it was also an intellectual virtue. Um, it was not something that you had to tie yourself in some sort of spiritual knot to achieve, making yourself seem worse than you really are or anything like that. But rather he emphasizes again and again in his writings that a good writer is one who makes you not look at him, but rather makes you see through the lens that he is seeing through. And this outward movement of the mind and of the eyes um, towards the reality out there and our way of seeing it rather than looking at ourselves is something that he valued very much uh, in literature and in scholarship and therefore also embodied in his life quite naturally as, a, as part of that, I think. Thank you. Peter? Uh, the, the famous aphorism on humility just sprung to mind, which is this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. <laughs> Thank you. Bill, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think Jerry is right in reminding us that we've got to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. But I have to say, I think it's striking really how little of C.S. Lewis's personal life comes through in his works, uh, apart from, say, Surprised by Joy. He doesn't put himself forward. He doesn't tell anecdotes about, I was walking in the quad the other day and spoke to this professor or a student said this and that to me. Really, you, you can appreciate his apologetic works without knowing anything about Mrs. Moore or his brother or his life. So I don't think it's true that the effectiveness of his work depends upon his living it out in his personal life. Uh, I was really surprised by a lot of his personal life when I read McGrath's biography of Lewis, there, there's, his works stand on their own, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, independent of his life, because in most cases, the man doesn't intrude into his books in a personal way, which is perhaps a mark of humility itself. Mm. Yes, I think he deliberately tried to keep himself off stage as much as possible, and that's part, part of what mere Christianity is about, isn't it? Because he's not wanting to say, this is my religion. He's wanting to say, this is the broad, central, mainstream of the faith, to which pretty much every Christian could subscribe. But I myself, he says, am not, I'm, I'm a very ordinary layman of the Church of England. 
which is a vast <laughs> understatement. But, Would that we were all that But ordinary. in a sense, you see what he's trying to say, that he's not, he's not extraordinarily um, uh, virtuous. Um, he's, he's just ordinary. He's neither particularly high nor particularly low nor particularly anything else. He's not trying to convert you to a particular brand of Christianity or indeed churchmanship within Anglicanism. He's just wanting to give you something um, beyond all the denominations or within all the denominations. I think we should come to our last question now, and, and after which I will ask Don King to come and read the poem. Uh, this final question comes from A.J. Finch. What particular books or articles of Lewis have impacted the panelists especially and should be better known today? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going, gosh, where do we begin, you know? Um, uh, uh, can I jump in? Yeah. Um, the Abolition of Man, his lectures, a very short book, three lectures, um, The Abolition of Man, uh, I think, is, again, is one of those very prophetic books about our, about our times. Um, should be read next to Aldous Huxley's Brave New World um, for understanding the modern world. Um, and his defense there of the, the objectivity of, of beauty, of, of knowledge and things, but also on the other extreme, not wanting to go into a sort of shallow rationalism that we've mm. talked about, mm. of, of, you, of uniting, of, of seeing the way through uh, this modernist, postmodernist dilemma that the world has got itself into, uh, and the way he resolves that and his defense of those kind of values in, in essays like um, The Poison of Subjectivism and um, De Futilitate, uh, which is a particular flavor of mine. Mm. The Abolition of Man. There's an interesting book about the abolition of man, which is too little known. It's by, the, by Lord Hailsham, sometime Lord Chancellor, who, who thought very highly of the abolition of man himself um, and wrote a little book about it called Values, Collapse or Cure. Um, so you're there with, with Quintin Hogg. Um, anybody else want to come in on that? Um, well, I think that there are some essays and works of Lewis that have gained new popularity, that have been mined quite a lot recently, and I think De Fertilitata and The Poison of Subjectivism and so forth belong to those that have been worked up by people like Alvin Plantinga in very interesting and rigorous ways. I think that there are some other essays um, whose main argument or idea hasn't really been touched upon very much at all by academia, and I think that transposition in particular and the funeral of a great myth as well are some of those, and I'm sort of waiting to see whether people will pick that, those up and, and make something of them in the way that um, things like miracles have, have been made something of. So those would be uh, some of my recommendations, I suppose. Thank you. Jeanette? Um, I would say almost any of his letters, really. Um, I've been amazed reading through his letters how I can read them almost like uh, Lectio Divina, where it's like contemplative reading. There's so much of his faith in there, so much good advice, so much of God, and uh, he can't write a dull sentence. It's fantastic. <laughs> Michael? M my most surprising Lewis learning experience by far was buying a copy of um, the screw tape letters read out loud by John Cleese. Um, I never thought Basil Fawlty would teach me theology. Um, I tried reading the book, um, and I think I read the first six in one day, and it was almost like it was too rich. I put it down and forgot about it. I discovered those, and I listened to one a day uh, in my car and disciplined myself to press stop and not go any further. This is when I had a cassette player. Um, and, and it was a remarkable experience. I think both hearing them read out loud um, and also just thinking and reflecting on actually just how much, again, was packed in there. It, Surprise, deceptively simple, but actually much deeper. And, and I think opens up the whole question of, is there a spiritual realm to life? And does it interact with us? Is there a battle and struggle that's going on around us that we're not aware of? And um, yeah, I, it, it's, if you can get hold of it, I don't know if you can get hold of it anymore, but try, try John Cleese reading, reading the screw tape letters. It's being read this week, isn't it, on Radio 4 by Simon Russell mm -hmm. Beale. Really? Um, and there's also... A they should have got Michael McIntyre. <laughs> yeah. There's also a recording by Andy Serkis. Yeah. Mm. Uh, lots of uh, actors are wanting to take this part. Mm. <laughs> uh, do we have any offerings from this side um, of the panel? 
For me, as I shared in my opening remarks, it hasn't been so much any particular work of Lewis that has been influential, so much as it has been his serving as a role model of Christian apologetics. As a young student, for me, Francis Schaeffer and Edward J. Carnell were more shaping influences on my thought, and then later Alvin Plantinga. But Lewis as a role model, I think, has been important in his defense of mere Christianity and his endorsement of the project of natural theology and Christian evidences in defense of the Christian faith. And in that role model, I uh, follow and try to emulate Lewis. Thank you. I think answering for myself, I would say uh, one, of, one of Lewis's works which ought to be better known is um, the essay with the terrible title, Blusbles and Flallon Spheres, A Semantic Nightmare, um, which has actually been quoted from several times today uh, in the definitions of imagination as the organ of meaning and reason as the natural organ of truth. Uh, it's a, terrible, a terribly titled essay. If Lewis had called it the importance of, of metaphor in all our knowing, everybody would have flocked to this essay. Um, it's, a, it's a very deep and, and seminal um, case that he makes. It, and uh, it should be better known. As regards my own favorite work, I think I would probably cite uh, his last novel, Till We Have Faces. Uh, Lewis himself regarded that as easily his best work. Um, I understand that Rowan Williams thinks most highly of that, of all of Lewis's works, and I share that opinion. It's an amazingly deep, rich, mysterious novel, which is hard to conceptualize, hard to understand, except while you are reading it. Uh, because it is truly mythic, I think. You have to enjoy it in order to understand it, and to enjoy it, you have to read it. And reread it. <laughs> and then re reread it. <laughs> We're approaching our last few minutes, so I think at this juncture, uh, I may ask Professor Don King to come and close proceedings for us by reading this poem, The Apologist's Evening Prayer, after which we can draw proceedings to a close. So, Don. As one who's been reading Lewis's poetry for 40 years, uh, I would add that some of you might want to begin reading Lewis's poetry. The Apologist's Evening Prayer was not published until 1964, but it appears in a letter in 1942, and I think it picks up on the question that Jerry asked just a moment ago. The Apologist's Evening Prayer. From all my lame defeats, and oh, much more, from all the victories that I seemed to score, from cleverness shot forth on thy behalf, at which, while angels weep, the audience laugh, from all my proofs of thy divinity, thou who wouldst give no sign, deliver me. Thoughts are but coins. Let me not trust, instead of thee, their thin, worn image of thy head. From all my thoughts, even from my thoughts of thee, O thou fair silence, fall and set me free. Lord of the narrow gate and the needle's eye, take from me all my trumpery, lest I die. Thank you, Don, and please thank the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, as the panel leaves, uh, on behalf of the Dean and Chapter, I'd like to express our thanks to Michael in particular. Uh, Michael has been a key agent of this whole project. Uh, Vernon has driven it as far as we're concerned. I'm thrilled to be looking forward to dedicating the memorial uh, to C.S. Lewis tomorrow in Poets Corner. But this has been a wonderful curtain raiser and uh, a wonderful inspiration for many of us who don't know C.S. Lewis as, best, as well as we might and are now determined to get to know him better. As one who read Screwtape Letters and others when I was a teenager, was very much inspired by them and very much encouraged by them, it's wonderful to have been brought back to C.S. Lewis uh, in this way. And I'm myself grateful for today 
uh, looking forward to tomorrow. But please, since Michael has asked us to thank the panel, please thank Michael. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else.